thank you everyone for being here and thank you nick thank you jasmine thank you riv fantastic so we'll go over um a couple of logistic items um some people have already submitted some questions through the chat on the osprey camera webpage. um i think i have one email question um, and at any time, for those that are attending this live Q&A, you can type your question into that Q&A um, box there. Um, and if you have a question that you would like to ask live, you can um, raise your hand. And when it, once, uh, once we get to that time, we'll, uh, we'll call on you and we'll make sure that I push the right buttons and we can hear your question live. Um, so what we're going to do now is Michael has prepared his presentation to kind of guide us through the citizen science project um, aspect of the Osprey camera and uh, some of the other cameras around the world that he's been working with. So we are going to watch that video now and we'll make sure I can successfully uh, stream the right screen here. So um, here we go. Thank you so much everyone for watching this, but most importantly, for being part of this special project. Without your help, without your love for Ospreys, this would not be possible. My name is Michael Academia, lead researcher, recent graduate from Humboldt State University in California, and soon to be graduate student, teaching assistant at the College of William and Mary in Virginia. I can't express the amount of gratitude for your time participation and hard work with this project. Don't forget to have fun, be curious, and stay involved. Special thanks to Riv, whose expertise shines through in high quality data collection. I'm learning so much from you, thank you. Jasmine, thank you for being a moderator on the discussion board and keeping everyone engaged. Nick, thank you for your technical expertise, your energy for taking this ball and rolling with it. This is fantastic. A little bit about me. I belong to the Raptor Research Foundation on the Code of Conducts Committee, also the Scientific Programs Committee. Ospreys are worldwide citizens. Right? They occur in every continent except Antarctica. And what brings us together is our love for ospreys. So with the Code of Conduct Committee, we're always trying to create a space that is safe and we want to foster this collaborative type of effort in an environment in which we can feel comfortable. So thank you for honoring that. And hopefully we can continue this type of energy, this type of feel onto the discussion board, onto the website. I am actually much older than I look. For 16 years, I lived and worked in the Bay Area near San Francisco in California, and I had an exclusive contract with the government, the San Mateo County of California. And somehow I've managed to convince human resources that they needed my services to promote health and wellness for the employees. Specifically, I was providing on-site chair massage and also providing education and healthcare coaching. You know, when we're in front of the computers doing this all day, we get carpal tunnel syndrome, we get repetitive motion injuries, we get neck injuries. So my job was to go to different locations and help people, you know, get their bodies back in a comfortable state. You know, we don't want to be like this all day, forever, right? Well, this type of work was very demanding energetically. 
So the way I re-energized myself, the way I rejuvenated was going into nature, going camping, going hiking, but most importantly, going fishing. And growing up in Hawaii, fishing, the elders taught us you know, to look to nature for answers. Before humans had the technology such as fish finders to find fish, what did we use to help us locate fish? That's right, we used birds. So with my career here in California, I often found myself at mountain lakes, rivers, the bays, coastal environments, and there they were, the ospreys, you know, they're just so charismatic. They're the only bird of prey, the only raptor that dives into the water, that plunges into the water and brings out a you know, trophy-sized fish. So as an angler, as a fishing person, growing up in Hawaii with the elders in mind, you know, it's like, okay, there is a beautiful bird there with this nice trophy-sized fish. I need to go to that location. Well, at a certain point, ospreys became more important than fish and fishing. And I would rather leave the fish in the water than on my dinner plate. I would rather have the fish available for the ospreys. And this was just the impetus that created a huge change in my life. You know, I was successful. I was comfortable. I had a great career, but that all changed. And I felt like it was unconscionable. It was not right. It didn't feel right to just remain idle and, you know, going about status quo, doing about my day. And I decided to go back to school and dedicate my life to science. And that is the direction that I'm heading towards. And I'm so excited that I'm going to be a graduate teaching assistant at the College of William and Mary with Dr. Brian Watts, who is one of the leading scientists with Osprey Research. In fact, I'll be working at Chesapeake Bay with the Manhattan population. Manhattan population, it's a type of herring in which a foreign company called Omega is capturing all this fish, um, harvesting all this fish and reducing them into your essential fatty acids such as EPA and DHA. But the fishing pressure is just too much. And at Chesapeake Bay, you have the world's largest breeding osprey population from 8,000 to 9,000 breeding pairs. So that's 16,000 to 18,000 ospreys, not including the floaters. So I'm trying to make sure that, that they get fed. And I feel like it is one of the main purposes for my work is to build the bridge between ornithology and fishery science. Also, another project that is very dear to me, it is with citizen science and nest video cameras. This is our time, this is our community. I have a sensitivity to those who are disabled, not just physically, those who are elderly, those who can't have expensive birding gear, those who don't travel or have transport to go on the field. You know, for a long time, some of us, need to stay in the comfort and safety of our own home, right? And I think right now the world gets it with the pandemic going around, you know? So it is our time to, to really bring to light, to showcase our work. And even though, you know, we need to stay in the comfort and safety of our own home, regardless of the pandemic, you know, we should not be excluded from being observers of the real world and collecting data and being contributors to science. Despite the wealth of information out there, this is not universally accepted, but we can change this. There is this preconceived notion that citizen science doesn't go through the rigors of However, this, this is wrong. Under the right circumstances, under proper data collection, what RIV is doing, you know, what you're doing with collecting the date, the time, the observations that you're noticing, having them in a succinct manner is the product of high quality data, which we need to produce for science. Also, quality assurance, having 
members of your team, such as wildlife biologists, fisheries biologists, to look at the data and to verify and make sure that everything's okay. And also finally, direction. Direction from your academic institutions, from your professional scientists, to direct you to a way to collect the data. All of this can lead to high quality insights and innovations. The goals of this study are to record fish counts. So we are working with about four to five nations and that's also included about 17 to 18 groups. So that's a lot of people to work with, each with their own team, right? So it's difficult to find a concordance basis of information so that I can analyze. But what seems to be the common foundation is the record amount of fish counts. And my goal is to use that daily fish counts and correlate it to weather. I'm going to be harvesting data from NOAA, from NASA, and seeing if I can correlate the daily weather patterns with the daily fish counts. And in Dr. Alan Poole's new book, Ospreys, The Revival of a Global Raptor, on page 184, it specifically states that future research researchers need to focus on daily fish counts and see if there's any relationship with daily weather patterns. So that's gonna be one of the primary investigations with this project. Number two, some of the nests have fish species, not all of them. Um, there's some higher degrees of uncertainty. So those nests that have the quality assurance, fish species will be included in the study. But also too, it's really important to record and observe important observations. There could be predation, competition, anything that can stop ospreys from you know, foraging. There could be you know, human disturbances, things that you can record. All of this can lead to being predictors of nest success or failure. So there is an information gap that we can fill. There is a research need that we can obtain through nest video cameras and citizen science. So just to get everyone excited about who else is involved in this project, we have OCU's Canada, we have Satakunan in Finland with Dr. Yari Valkama, and they actually have four nest video cameras and they're starting to take data on that too. So we have a lot of data that's coming, it's so exciting. We have Sailey Island in, in Finland also at the University of Turku. Um, I stuttered there for a moment because today uh, a hooded crow just uh, killed all of the eggs. There was some nest abandonment and I've noticed in the past few days that not much fish was being delivered. So when parents can't satisfy their own energetic requirements, they abandon the nest so that they can forage. Well, during that time period, a hooded crow came in and destroyed all the eggs. So that was just sad to witness today. Lock of the Lows in UK. And also the uh, ground team there, early in the breeding season, things looked hopeful, but there was some human disturbance. The breeding pair there is okay, but they just found another nest to occupy and to make active. Barnegat Light in New Jersey with Ben Wurst. Ben Wurst is a osprey champion and hero. He goes out there on the Jersey shore, on the marshes, and he installs platforms. He rescued an osprey a couple days ago from fishing line. So he is definitely someone to look into and research about. Colorado, you're representing so well in this study, the city of Boulder, the open space and mountain po parks program. Howlitz in Washington, then Roven Ranch in Montana, and Colorado, thank you so much for representing well. Emma at Pitkin County, Lake Murray in South Carolina. The hatchlings just hatched all three and they're doing very well. Savannah, Georgia, and those three eggs aren't eggs anymore. They're two hatchlings. One didn't make it due to siblicide and sibling aggression but the two that are remaining are very well fed and they're growing feathers. And Chesapeake Bay. And that nest was also predated upon by a crow. The bad weather conditions at Chesapeake Bay, we believe that the fish 
moved deeper into the bay and the parents again could not meet the requirements of their own energetic needs so they abandoned the nest and was also predated by a crow speaking about bad weather this happened the snowstorm of april 16th and i had to email rev several times for reassurance because i'm from california you know and and from hawaii so i don't deal with snow although you know heavy precipitation events can kill hatchlings but i asked rev you know are they going to be okay this is a lot of snow i'm not okay with this i hope everything's going to be okay um but you can see you can see there the the look of stress this is also a other photo from Riv. Thank you so much for providing this. But as you can see there, the nest is completely covered. And I did some research and, you know, some eggs can, call, can tolerate being covered by snow for 12 to 24 hours. But the original three eggs had been buried for approximately 58 hours. And last I checked, I think one of the eggs was unviable and was removed. So at one point after the snow melted, there was a total of five eggs. So I know this is very juicy, very exciting, and I know that there was a lot of questions being asked and a lot of information that was needed. And I did some research, but the questions that were you know, being brought up, you know, is this instinctual, biological, hormonal response to the out of sight eggs? Would, could it be the same as if the eggs were destroyed or removed from the nest? You know, was the fourth or fifth egg, was that assumed to be the completion of her first clutch? Could the loss of the clutch trigger the laying of the fifth egg? Could this be a type of replacement clutch sort of way? As opposed to the female being set to lay five eggs had there not been a storm. So the possible research question, right? Are eggs laid during after removal part of the first clutch or as a replacement clutch? Did some research and the answer is we do not know there is no definitive conclusions there's hardly any scientific articles but we do know it is very rare for there to be five or more eggs per osprey clutch right based on the scientific literature we do not have substantial evidence to make a definitive conclusion however this type of inquiry this type of curiosity is how research gets started. And that's why your work is very important. Like I mentioned earlier in the presentation, these questions, this curiosity, this fascination for learning can lead to high quality insights and innovations that were otherwise not stated in books, you know, or um, not really expanded upon by scientists. So one of the research articles that I wanted to share with you is more contemporary. It's from the Journal of Raptor Research, and it didn't have anything specifically about osprey, so I had to go general. And this was an article about eagles. And just to go over some of the semantics, the contemporary definition or phenomenon that this could be is called a replacement clutch. And the definition of this is simple. It is just a clutch of eggs that are immediately laid after the failure of the first. The most important thing about this article is that it stated that the success of the replacement clutch depends on the early laying date of the initial clutch of eggs. And this pair, we know this pair, they've been working together for a long time, and I know that they are ahead, they are ahead of the game. And without having them lay their eggs early, and if something like this happened later in the season, there would not be a replacement clutch. So I really believe in this pair. They know what they're doing, and I have faith in them for this season, which is really great. The other scientific article that I wanted to share is an older one. It's from the Condor in 1980. And their definition is called double clutching, which is the removal of the first clutch specifically to induce the laying of another in the same season as a potential technique for increasing the productivity of the ex existing population. So there's some conservation implications if we were to do a experiment with the replacement clutch such as what happened with this nest and this pair you know we could 
cover them, the eggs, you know, if they laid, laid eggs early in the season, cover them or remove them and see if that would trigger a hormonal response in which it would produce a second clutch, a replacement clutch. I know that ospreys are not endangered in some areas, but in some states it's actually uh, threatened, or even in Europe where they face lots of persecution. The numbers aren't bouncing back as fast as it is here. So, you know, this could be like a type of method that could be used to help produce and encourage the population to bounce back. So that definitely got my head spinning, and I thank you all of you for that. It is quite fascinating. And again, I know I have, sometimes I have a difficulty in not anthropomorphizing, but that is just so adorable. I wanted to highlight that. Thank you so much, Ria, for sharing that photo. You know, this is unique amongst the nests. I have not seen this with other nests. The only time that I've seen this is with the San Francisco nest, the Golden Gate Audubon nest. And it's just really cute. <laughs> I also wanted to end on a funny note. That photo was taken by Kathleen Finnerly. And look at that osprey. It's just totally you know, self-possessed. It knows who it is. And the timing of this is just remarkable. Um, Thank you everyone for your support. I'm definitely gonna be needing your moral support as I collect the data, analyze the data, and present it to the scientific community and conferences and hopefully, hopefully get this published in a high impact journal. Sometimes editors and peer reviewers, they can really sink their teeth into you and just rip your work to shreds. So I'm definitely gonna need your moral support and I will keep you updated. So we're going to head over to our live question and answers. So please, I want this to be like a conversation. I wanna hear your comments or your questions. All right, wow, that was really, really cool. Um, so many uh, amazing things going on there in that, in that video, Michael. Um, uh, during that time, um, Riv uh, was able to join us. So uh, Riv, real quick, uh, give an introduction and uh, say hi to everybody. Oh, you're muted. <laughs> or we can't hear you. Let me try that. How there about we turning go. the mic? Okay, oh, my microphone was actually off. <laughs> <laughs> I'm unmuted Zoom, but not the microphone. Um, I'm Riv, and uh, a lot of you know me from uh, the chat or the Facebook group, and I followed this nest for five years, I think it is, and have collected various data, uh, some of it more rigorously than other. Uh, I was using it mostly for myself, but apparently some of the fish counts uh, Michael may be able to use for his research, so I'm excited about that. Um, I uh, love the ospreys and actually this was my first nest I ever watched and I fell in love with both the ospreys and this particular pair. Uh, my background is in natural sciences. Um, I do not have a degree but I have enough credits for a degree. That's just how things went with my life. Uh, lots of uh, biology, ornithology, uh, biochemistry and that sort of thing and I just enjoy being here and sharing time with our, our chatters and helping to inform as I learn things from everybody. Fantastic. Thanks for that, um, for that intro. So, uh, Michael, like I said, there was a ton of things going on there. Um, I think it was just so cool, just the number of nests that you have involved in your projects. Uh, just, just really cool just to think that, that um, our nest here in Longmont, Colorado is part of something in Canada and Finland and um, all throughout the United States. So that's really cool. I'm sure that was a ton of effort to, um, <laughs> to, uh, uh, yeah, to, to round up everybody and, and keep everybody organized. So what's that been like? Yeah, that's, it's, it's a global effort. We have a global team. Australia is also involved. We got Scotland 
And, you know, there, there's even more us in Italy that I'm trying to get involved. But again, it's just contacting each and every group was just, I've been doing this for like the past six months, you know, just try to get everyone together. But it's not just one person, it's like coordinators, organizations, human resources. So it's just like a massive undertaking to get everyone on board. But everyone's just been so excited about this. And with the world, the way it is now, everyone's just on board and it's our time. The opportunity is just ripe. Fantastic. Um, <clears throat> all right, so we have a, we've got, um... Just to remind again of how this works, at any time, if you're uh, on the webinar, go ahead and um, you can submit a question. You can type in your question into that Q&A, um, or if you would rather ask your question um, uh, using your voice, you can raise your hand and I can call on you there. Um, we do have one question. How can you tell that the eggs are inviolable? So, so usually... Uh, <laughs> yeah, go ahead. So around May, April to May, right, the co copulation will trigger a uh, response in the female to produce eggs. And there's like a, a window of time in which the eggs get actually laid and they have to be fertilized. And if the, the eggs aren't fertilized, if they miss the date, usually it takes about 35 days for the eggs to hatch. And if they don't hatch by then, we'll definitely know that it's not viable. But sometimes the eggs gets damaged and, and the female will know or the male will know and they'll just remove the egg. So um, uh, Jasmine, maybe you want to answer this question here. This was asked to me by um, somebody and I didn't know the answer. Um, I, have, I have backyard chickens. So I know that <laughs> those birds will lay eggs even if there's, um, and I just have hens. So I don't have a rooster. So I know those birds will lay, uh, lay eggs even if there's no um, copulation or whatever. So is that the same thing with, with osprey or other birds of prey? Yeah, they do, they do lay eggs that are not fertile. So it's been documented in other raptor nests and other breeding programs between other raptors, eagles, they just will lay a non-fertile egg. Mm -hmm. And does, um, uh, I don't know, does a, does a fertilization like event or a mating event have to occur after an egg is laid for another egg to be laid? Does that make sense? Another egg can be laid even if, it's, if there hasn't been any copulation. Uh, and the, the sperm actually remains in the, uh, in the uh, female's reproductive system for it's not known the exact amount of time for ospreys, but it's um, up to days for uh, some other species that have been studied closely. So even if uh, the female ovulates and there isn't copulation, uh, while it travels down the oviduct and everything, there's still possibility for that egg to be fertile, even though there's not copulation. The chances of it being fertile are much higher if um, there is copulation that happens uh, after, uh, uh, once the ov ovulation occurs. Great. Uh, so we got a, um, another question here. Are osprey persecuted in some places because of perceived competition with human fishing? Yes, indeed. They have, um, for a while in, in Europe, they were heavily persecuted because they were deemed as competition for, for fish and also for egg collection. Although in Europe, the persecution has ceased in the developing countries where food security is an issue uh, with aquaculture and aqua farms. All of our, um, there's a big worry that the juveniles who are traveling south for their wintering grounds, they are getting fish from these aquifer, aqua farms and aquaculture and some of them are being shot. So we don't have that much research about this yet. So I was actually talking to some professors, some researchers and this could definitely be possible research subject in the future, like a PhD, or we just need to get the right numbers. We don't know the rate of, um, of, of killing ospreys. All right, good. Um, somebody asked if we know the status of the nest at Longmont High School. So Longmont High School is oh. uh, located um, uh, just pretty close to the fairgrounds in Longmont. I don't have an answer to that. I don't know 
um, if anybody else monitors any of the other these other nests that are in Longmont or the area. I did contact them. I wanted them to be included in the study, actually. Yeah. And I was talking to one of the, the teachers, and uh, <laughs> I haven't heard back from them. Um, one of the things about that camera is that they don't have a playback option, so it's difficult to get um, to, mm -hmm. to rewind and review the tape. Uh, the last I, I talked to the teacher, she was trying to ask IT if they had any capabilities to do that. But so far, I mean, what I saw, the, uh, the egg is occupied and uh, there is incubation happening. That's great. Um, it was also really great to see the city of Boulder's Osprey camera um, looked like yeah. it was back up online. It looked, looked like it was off for a while, so I was a little worried. Um, but it looked, I just checked it this morning and saw, um, yeah, saw that that was back online. So that was really great. It's just amazing at how many cameras there are around the world. And uh, Michael, one of the things I thought you, you said was really cool um, is just how uh, this kind of is, just, is a way to make wildlife a little bit more accessible for people who with um, uh, either, uh, you know, because they're either uh, the abilities don't allow them to get out, um, but also just being able to kind of have this 24 seven live look on, on things. So even though our camera isn't necessarily in like a remote destination, um, <laughs> it's still been really cool. And um, it's also cool to see the, how people can actually go out to the fairgrounds and visit on the ground and be able to see um, what's happening, you know, that we can't actually ca capture with cameras. So that's been pretty great. Uh, we have, had what, I, yes, had one thing to, I had one thing to say about the uh, people who can't get out and about. That's how I actually started watching. I was housebound for almost six years due to a medical condition and only recently been able to get out and do things. And it was a lifeline for me to be able to connect with people on chat, to be able to watch the cam and talk about what was going on and learn so much, you know, every day. I, I, and I know other people who, who are in similar uh, situations and it, these cameras are truly godsends for people. So thank you, Boulder County, for uh, providing. <laughs> it's very, very well said. Yeah, yeah, thank you for sharing that. Uh, going back to that, um, that Longmont High School nest, um, B and B, which I believe is Barb and Bob, said in oh, the B &B. chat that <laughs> that nest was actually destroyed by a windstorm last week. So. Oh no! no. Uh, oh, that's sad. Um, thank you, oh, thank you, B and B, for the update. Yeah, uh, we got another question from Corin. What happens if an area decides to stop stocking fish? So. Within Colorado, osprey are not a native bird. Um, Colorado doesn't really have a lot of large bodies of water for the osprey to, to feed. And so it's only been within like the last 50 years, a lot of these gravel ponds uh, in the front range area have been turned into, um, into uh, these the gravel mines have been turned into ponds and then have been stocked um, to promote uh, fishing. So. Um, have you seen, any of you seen that in any of your studies of when an area stops stocking fish and what that does to osprey population? That's a great question. Thank you for asking that. I'm going to actually update everyone on the, the numbers that we have so far for your nest. So uh, currently we had about, we have about 136 fish delivered of 56 total days and about 2.4 fish delivered per day. And 65% of the species, they're, they're, they're trout. So that's a huge number that the ospreys are dependent upon. And food shortage is like the ultimate cause for uh, breeding failure. And if ospreys don't get enough fish, they will just not be able to have the resources to meet their own energetic requirements or the requirements for, for their young. So it's just, it would be tragic. And that's like a, that's one of the big things that I'm working on is just building the bridge between ornithology and fishery science. It's like, I feel like it's my job to make sure that the ospreys get fed. And I know that there is a lot of you know, uh, conflicts and different interests with um, hatchery fish and, and stocking fish, but it, 
the wildlife, ospreys, not only ospreys, but wildlife de depend on them. So, I mean, <laughs> we need the trout. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's just, it's a, it's a whole ecosystem, right? It's not just like, it hey, is. we're just throwing fish in so people can, you know, have a fun time. It, uh, it's, 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 that, it's that whole wheel there. So that's very cool. Um, all right. Uh, Dave three has his hand raised. Dave three wishes to talk. So Dave, you are allowed to speak. <laughs> Hi, Dave. All right. Unmute myself. Uh, I, I just, I, I'm uh, one of the wildlife files for County Parks and Open Space. I'm a little late to the call. I was on another call, but um, I think along the St. Brain, which is where our majority of our uh, osprey nests are, we're not going to run short of fish. A lot of the fish that are in those lakes are warm water fish that are sort of self perpetuating. So, and that we have a lot of lakes. So, I don't think we'll, we're not going to run short of fish for osprey. And in fact, we're, we're seeing quite the opposite. We're seeing more and more probably offspring of osprey return and we're proliferating nests here. So, this area is an area where we have an abundance of fish. Uh, I was a little shocked at the number of trout uh, the percentage that you just gave me there um, because most of the trout I think are stocked fish so it's either Parks and Wildlife stocking them, City of Longmont stocking them, Boulder County stocking them um, and, and those are trout that are intended for fishermen but Osprey are the, the lucky bystanders uh, going after those fish, I think it might be an artifact of them being easier to catch. Yeah. <laughs> uh, than some of those other narrow bodied fishes. Anyway, oh, it's I'll true. Get up my I did want to say that uh, I thought um, at least here we're lucky enough that we've got enough acreage in, uh, in water that's got fish in it and it's not going to be short of, of uh, fish. Great. Well, thank so you. Thanks, Dave. Thank you, Dave, for the information. So I, I, at Humboldt State University, I am a fish, I was a fish technician working on the on-site hatchery and stocked fish that are, you know, raised in a hatchery. They have no idea what the real world is like. So when they get released into nature, they're just, you know, swimming around with, with not a care in the world. And all of a sudden, you know, you have this attack from above from an osprey. So it's, it's easy pickings. They just have it, you know, adapted to, <laughs> to the dangers of the real world. Great, we've got a couple questions about banding osprey. And um, this is something we're asked a lot. And I, I really wish that we could uh, band our osprey. So the way that it works within, the, within Boulder County is uh, as D Dave was on, was, you know, just, was just spoke, he's one of um, several wildlife biologists within our department. Um, we, uh, you know, we, we kind of monitor all of the species within Boulder County on our open space areas, but we also work very closely with Colorado Parks and Wildlife. Colorado Parks and Wildlife is kind of like the uh, division of wildlife for the state of Colorado. So anything like that that we would do, we would uh, be involved with them. And when we've approached them about it, they really haven't shown much interest um, in banding um, our osprey. So well, it is something that we would really like to do. Um, there just hasn't been an interest at that next level up that we would need in order to, to band and uh, be able to track where they would go. Because um, like we've seen with some of these other nests, it's just really cool just to see on a map just how far these osprey really fly, where they're going, um, kind of where they are in real time, you know, how close are they coming back to Colorado. So um, they are not being banded, and we and we wish we uh, and we wish we could. So that would also answer if we have some of the visitors are offspring, because this pair certainly has uh, a lot of offspring from the past years, and we have some um, intruders who come in and are very well tolerated, and other and most of them are just chased right off. So we, there's always that question of, is this uh, bird that has landed on the nest and they're tolerating them, uh, the parents are tolerating them for a minute or two, are those actually offspring? Do they recognize them? So it would be lovely to be able to correlate uh, whether or not those, uh, those intruders are actually offspring. We can't though. <laughs> yeah, very cool. 
That's a research uh, question, though. That is definitely it is. the curiosity. That is the innovation and insights. That yes, can develop. yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, Jasmine, you had. Uh, do you have a couple questions for us through the that were submitted through the chat? Yes, yes. Uh, so Rachel asks, "Do ospreys keep cool by panting?" And if that's not it, why does mom sometimes play with her beak open while incubating during the day? Good question. Yes, they, they do therm thermoregulate by panting, but they also like to fluff their feathers and that way they can expose some of the skin to let off some of the heat. But what I really love about Osprey moms are the, the mombrellas. <laughs> That's like one of a, like a great word that, that goes around in the uh, Osprey video camera communities. Uh, a mombrella will, you know, use herself as an umbrella, protecting the, the hashlings from the sun and from the heat. Mm -hmm. We've also seen mom also go down to the pond and get her feet wet, too. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so that was cool to see. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So uh, there's another question. Uh, Christine asks, I'm curious if they have ever viewed another five eggs laid so close together like our female osprey did. Yeah, exactly. No, I haven't seen it, and there's no research about it. So this is definitely unique. And the thing about science is that you always want to present something that's really innovative, something new. But then science will come back to you and say, well, you don't have enough substantial data, so we can't really almost count your work. And substantial meaning that we need, we need more evidence. We need more than just one nest in order to reach a, a conclusive, definitive answer. So a lot of the problem is that when you have something happening at your nest, it'll be perceived as it being just anecdotal. You know, it's just a personal account. But that doesn't, that doesn't mean that we should stop, right? I mean, we could, we could see if the other cameras or the other nest videos or other nests have something similar happening. And then we can make comparisons at, with analysis, with data analysis with, that, with them and see what we can um, surmise. Awesome. Um, another question from the chat is by Prissy. She's asking where are trout found? Um, if they're found in rivers or ponds naturally? Yeah, usually it's an inland lake. They're, they're freshwater fish, but um, you know, they, they're originally from you know, the Pacific Northwest and they rainbow trout specifically has been raised and has been planted and stocked everywhere in the world. So that's mostly where trout comes from, if, if not from their natural place, it, it's, it's from hatcheries. Anything else? Um, those are all the ones that were submitted on chat. All right, um, I don't see any other, uh, I saw b and had a question, but it says a question for Dave. We could probably get Dave back on B and B if you want to ask that question again. Um, I don't see anybody else's hand raised. Um, do any of you panelists have anything else you would like to um, ask or mention during this time? Uh, I have a question for Michael. Yes. Um, how are some of the ways pollution is absorbed by fish and then consumed by osprey show in osprey reproduction and behavior? Oh, that is a big one, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> Bioaccumulation and toxins in the environment, they travel up the trophic cascade and they have heavy, big impacts on ospreys. And ospreys are just like the epitome of sentinel species. Sentinel species is like being the canary in the coal mine and they can indicate to us whether there are toxins present in the environment. So for epidemiology, it is a really, they're really good tools. And a good example of that is in the, the DDT era. Um, I'm not too sure if any of you are familiar with uh, Rachel Carson and her work with Silent Spring. And for ospreys, there was a big four. It was ospreys, eagles, herons, and peregrine falcons, I think. But anyway, there was just so much DDT in the environment, in the water, in the fish, in, in everything that um, it was affecting uh, osprey's uh, reproductive system in which that the eggs were just so thin that they, the eggs would just, you know, would just collapse if, if uh, the mother would incubate on them. And that had huge dramatic impacts on the osprey population. I think we lost like, you know, half or more of the world's population. But uh, with 
scientists, you know, they were able to isolate what the problem was. And ospreys are just such an amazing recovery uh, species. It's a, it's a conservation success story. But there are new emerging toxins and pollutants in the environment, such as uh, PCBs. You know, uh, mercury is also another big one. And there's um, in the University of Montana, they're doing research on that. So ospreys as sentinel species, they can tell us what's happening with the environment, what's happening with the fish, what's happening in uh, the water. How about with, uh, with climate change? How is that affecting osprey populations? Oh yeah, that is a big, big question. And that will require lots and lots of data. So Dr. Brian Watts, who is gonna be my advisor at the College of William and Mary, he's also the director for, for the Center for Conservation Biology. And he's using citizen science with his uh, organization called um, Osprey Watch, and they're trying to monitor uh, nests in a huge space and, and time type of sequence to see if there is any correlation that they can get from climate change. But we are we're definitely worried about that big question because we don't know if they're going to, how are the ospreys going to migrate? Is there going to be a mismatch with the fish? The timing is going to be off. Will ospreys have enough food for the young, uh, and with climate change, you know, the, the acidification of the world's oceans, you know, fish are getting smaller, the, you know, fish itself, you know, it's going to have a difficult time. In fact, they predict there's going to be more jellyfish than in actual fish. So we don't know, but there's just a lot of concern. Right. Um, what, what can, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, what can we do to keep our waters healthier? Oh, definitely stay involved. You know, if, 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 if the water is not clean enough for ospreys and for fish, you definitely can't be <laughs> drinking that water. So the more you can be aware and more involved with, with your water, you know, people take water for granted. You know, then you have disasters that happen like in Flint, Michigan, you know, where the water just was so toxic, it was just poisoning everyone. And, or sometimes, you know, like a corporation will come in and take the water rights of your whole community. I'm not going to point out, <laughs> but that's happened. It's happened here. So, I mean, just be aware of your water and, and you know, your, your water is precious. Great, Riv, any, uh, any questions from you or thoughts? Uh, I have no specific uh, questions. Um... I was just going to say that, that to confirm that there was definitely one, because I saw a question about this, there was one egg of the five that had cracked and was taken out, uh, but all, all the other mm -hmm. four seemed to be uh, intact. Um, so we'll, we're just waiting to see what hatches. We are hoping for, sh for two healthy little baby ospreys, and <laughs> there's a we're, we're holding on to a slim hope for a third from that uh, egg that was freshly laid in the snow uh, because it was freshly laid and we don't know what the temperature was for that. But that's a slim miracle type chance. And we're thinking that the first egg um, is the first or second egg, whichever one is left in the nest would not be viable because it was buried for uh, 58 or so hours. So that was the, I was just addressing that one comment that I had seen. Great. Uh, last chance for any uh, questions from any of the attendees. Go ahead and type those in. And as while you're doing that, I just wanted to thank um, thank everybody. So this is really just a massive effort just to keep um, our camera up and going. Um, it's a lot of uh, time for for me to ensure that the the camera is working, um, but also our wildlife staff monitoring, um, our volunteers, our volunteer Jasmine, and we've got other. Um, birds of prey monitors that are out and about and constantly checking on the on um, on on ju not just this nest but all throughout Boulder County, um, and we've got great people like Riv who just um, just a wealth of knowledge in the chat and uh, and and making that a friendly place, and uh, and it was just so cool that just for someone like Michael just to email me and being like, hey, I've got this. Uh, the citizen pro science project and really wanted to see if you wanted to be involved. So um, definitely want to encourage everybody who watches the camera to participate in that. Um, that wouldn't be possible without RIV. So the way it works and correct me if I'm wrong 
um, you submit, um, whenever you see a fish being brought into the nest, you submit that form there. And that's actually going to RIV. And RIV is verifying everything, cleaning up the data before it actually goes to Michael and can be used inside of his research there. So um, thank you all for that. We do have uh, another question. Quick thank you to all the experts on the chat and really enjoying the community. Well, thank you, um, Corinne, and thank you for um, thank you for all the, the the participants in chat. And it's it's just such an amazing community. I was at a conference last fall and I got to talk about the Osprey camera and um, not not only are our birds just amazing to watch and this particular pair of Osprey is incredible. Um, but the, the chat community and just hearing everybody's stories, uh, Riv stories, um, I've heard Prissy's story, um, B and B, and then actually um, Jasmine also um, helps participate in the like Adopt a Trail, Adopt a Park program, where she's leading some um, trash pickup um, in the area as well. So it's just a just an amazing community, um, both locally and worldwide, to to be a part of. So. Yeah, thank you, Corinne, and thank you, um, Michael and Riv and Jasmine. This has been a great time. So any final comments from any of you? I just, I just thank you so much, everyone. <laughs> thank you so much. And I just wanted to say thank you to all of our chatters for the great participation and reporting the fish and asking questions and just being a wonderful community. Just I'm, I feel just honored and blessed to be a part of it. Great. Well, thank you all. This has been a great time, um, our first ever, and hopefully uh, we'll do this again um, at some time. Thanks again and have a great day. <laughs>